Yes, sir, you are visible. Uh, please unmute yourself. Okay, yeah. now it's on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now perfect. Yeah. All right. Now I'll share my slide. Yeah. Did you get these slides? Not yet. You shared yes, it? I, yes, I did that sharing. Still, it, uh, it's, it's not coming. Um, I'm sharing, okay, window. Is it coming? Uh, not yet. No? No, sir. No, no, no. No? Yeah, now it's coming. Yeah, yeah. It's coming. Okay, if I make it full view, is it coming? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it yeah. has come. Perfect. All right. Let's looks see. good. Uh, yeah, yeah, looks good. Yeah. Let's, let me see the running or not. Is the movie running visible there? Yeah, visible. Oh, yeah. Very good. Okay. That's perfectly fine. Perfect. Okay, the voice is clear? Yeah, clear. Good to go. All right. See, actually I was trying a different system, but apparently that didn't work. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. So I'm back to what it was, but it's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now it's fine, yeah. So we will uh, start sharp at uh, 7 p.m. So we are, yeah, four minutes uh, left. Four minutes right. to go. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. So okay. when you're ready, just let me know. Yeah, yeah, sure. Good. Hello, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Chakrabarti, can you please turn off your video?
Again, one small announcement, please, uh, please mute yourself, accept the speaker, and please turn off your video. Well, well, my speaker is turned on. Uh, yeah, off. yeah. No, you just uh, keep yourself as it is. And other than speaker, please, please uh, mute yourself and turn off the video. Shundaram, we are good to go, right? Yeah, yeah, good to go. Let's start. Professor Lakotia, we are ready. Okay, can you hear my voice? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, perfect, yeah. And my screen is visible? Yes, yes. Good, excellent. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. Welcome all to the Progress and Prospects in Biology webinar series. Thank you once again for joining from all around the globe. Uh, we truly appreciate your support and kind cooperation to bring the webinar series to you. Uh, it has been a special week for the organizing team as we hit two major milestones in engaging the wide participation, ranging from young scientists to senior academic. We have got thousand subscribers to our YouTube channel where we archive the talks for future viewing. So those who are new to the webinar series, please go ahead and subscribe and also watch other talks of your interest. Uh, we are also thankful to more than 2,000 interested listeners to the webinar series who have signed up to our Google group uh, to get the first-hand information of the webinar. Uh, we sincerely thank our speakers and the audience listening from both Google Meet and YouTube. I'll stop here and I'll now hand over to Shundra Macharya from CSR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology to host and moderate today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Shonok. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Again, a uh, warm welcome uh, all uh, to Progress and Prospects in Biology uh, webinar series. And as Shonok uh, mentioned, that it's uh, indeed the special week for us. And that's why, you know, cheers to all for love and support. And with this, uh, let's, let's start our journey today. And before uh, we sail off, uh, a couple of housekeeping stuff. Uh, so I'd request all of the audiences to mute your microphone and do not share your screen during the session. Please turn off your video as well to preserve the bandwidth and also pin the speaker screen in your Google Meet so that uh, you can visualize uninterrupted slides. Please uh, refrain yourself from posting any welcome messages in the chat box. Use chat box to post your questions and we'll moderate these after the winner of this webinar series. Professor NRI Banerjee, Department of Zoology, University of Calcutta to give the welcome address. And with this, over to you, uh, Professor Banerjee. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shonak, and thank you, Sundaram. Uh, it is a great privilege uh, that uh, we are welcoming uh, Professor uh, S.C. Lakotia today on this platform. And uh, Professor Lakotia, I am um, you in, uh, uh, in, not in person, virtually, after our uh, the 
hundred year celebrations in uh, Ramkrishna Mission. Right. So uh, it's nice to see you after a long time. I hope you're well. Uh, I, it is my privilege to introduce our today's speaker uh, to the participants. And uh, I must say uh, it is uh, very heartening to read what I'm going to read now uh, about one of the most distinguished um, uh, scientists uh, our country. Uh, so here goes. Uh, Professor S.C. Lakotia is engaged for nearly 55 years in studying gene expression and its regulation, replication in chromosomes, cell stress response, and significance of non-coding RNAs, mostly using the Drosophila model system. Nearly all of his research work has been carried out in India. His work in late 1960s established cellular autonomy of hyperactivity of the single X chromosome in male Drosophila to achieve dosage compensation. He was one of the first in early 1970s to demonstrate active transcription in heterochromatin. His group established temporal order of replication of independent replication units in polytin chromosomes in different cell types of Drosophila and revealed existence of two classes of active replicons in Drosophila. His groups made significant contributions to stress biology by showing different expression of some of the major heat shock proteins in different cell types in Drosophila and discovering multiple genes for HSP60 protein. His pioneering and lifetime contributions to biology of the HSR long non-coding RNA gene normal development and under conditions of cell stress in Drosophila since 1970 are well recognized. Uh, I think uh, this is something he has picked up more recently, which is uh, uh, his contributions to Ayurvedic biology using a Drosophila uh, as a fly model to provide new stimulus to active research in understanding cellular and molecular mechanisms of actions of Ayurvedic Rasayanas and other formulations. Establishing Drosophila as a model for cell and molecular biological studies on actions of standard Ayurvedic formulations, his group demonstrated biological effects of Amloki Rasayan and Rasha Sindur in the fly model parallel those indicated in classical Ayurvedic text. Significantly, both of them were shown to be very effective in suppressing neurodegeneration associated with Huntington's or Alzheimer's diseases. These findings were also confirmed in mouse models. He has written several articles on the need for active research in Ayurveda strongly believing that unbiased, proactive research using contemporary understanding of biological and material sciences is essential for revival of Ayurveda and its integration with contemporary healthcare system. Professor Lakotia, leading by personal example, is a strong votary of promoting high quality of research journals published in India. He has written many articles and organized discussion meetings on these issues and issues related to quality higher education in the country. In recognition of his contributions in research and education, he has received many awards and recognitions, including fellowships of all the three science academies in India. In addition, he is also the recipient of prestigious um, uh, awards uh, prizes, medals such as the INSA Young Scientist Medal, the SS Bhatnagar Prize, UGC Career Award, uh, UGC JC Bose Medal, and so on and so forth. He's associated with the Zoology Department of Benares Hindu University as a lifelong distinguished professor. Currently, he is also a CRB Distinguished Fellow. So with that introduction, um, our uh, listeners will well appreciate that today we truly have a doyen uh, of science. Uh, uh, and he is our own because he is also uh, an alumnus of our department, right, Professor Nakotia? Yes, yes, that's, that's right. right. So a, a very warm welcome to all the listeners. And with that, um, I hand over the podium to our today's speaker. Professor Lakota. Uh, Anna, and thanks, Sundaram, and the uh, organizers of this uh, remarkable uh, meeting. 
I, I'm very happy to share my journey that has been a very pleasure, uh, pleasure journey. And we started uh, with my PhD in Calcutta. And, and that's where I, I start my roots in. After my master's and PhD from Calcutta, that's where I got interested in this gene. Uh, so, so before going to that, let me just summarize what are the main areas of work that I've been doing for the last 30, 40 years, but more recently concentrating on the HSR omega non-coding gene in development and tumor tolerance, etc. Then stress proteins in tumor development and progression. And as was stated, Ayurvedic biology is my other passion, which I started to look at the molecular and cell biological studies on effects of some Ayurvedic uh, formulations. All work done on the supplement model. And of course, I have other a strong, equally strong interest in policies on higher education and research assessment policies and so on. And, and I place all my research... Sorry, Professor Lakotia. Uh, yes. Sorry, okay. Professor Lakotia. Uh, I'm interrupting. Uh, yes. Your presentation is uh, not showing. Can you please uh, share it again? Showing? Present it again? No, no, no. Okay, let me go back. And please pin, uh, pin to the screen so that... Uh, well, uh, okay, resume your presentation. Is that okay now? Yeah, now it's coming, yeah. It's coming? Yeah, 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 it's coming. And it's yeah. coming uh, full screen now? No, sir. No, not yet. Uh, yeah, now it, yeah, now, it, now it's no, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. perfect, right. perfect. Yeah. So, so this is what I just summarized, what the, my current area of work, and then... Uh, let me start my 93D story with uh, this uh, Calcutta lab where I work for my PhD. And it's on this side that I'm sitting here, uh, very different from what I look now. Uh, and, and this was the work that I was doing on doses composition to soft lab, trying to standardize, establish uh, what my supervisor, Dr. S. Mukherjee, has uh, shown that x component doses component to soft lab works by hyperactivation. And this was my first paper that came out on this. And, but, and then this led to the next question. Uh, following this PhD studies, three areas of uh, work started. One was heterochromatin replication, very different from what I had done. And the other was 93, that, that's what I'm going to talk about. And from with uh, my work on 93D, I also got interested in other heat shock genes into soft land, other insects. And of course, the thing has gone on, as I say, that, that research has, uh, follows a... Uh, uh, path like a river and uh, I would uh, advise everyone to follow it by passion not by fashion, not what is contemporary and we do it but just because we have a question and interest we should follow what we want to do now the, uh, the I just give a brief history of how I got into 93D path and uh, this started with benzamide and why benzamide as, as the screen shows my doctoral study was to establish the recently proposed hyperactive male X model and my hypothesis was, if the male X was more active, it should be more sensitive to inhibitors of chromosome transcription. Uh, alpha amenitin, which is very commonly used now, was not yet discovered in 1960s. Actinomycin D was the most commonly used transcription inhibitor, but I didn't like to use it because it was known that it primarily affected nucleolar rather than chromosome transcription. And therefore, I started searching for other transcription inhibitors, and in the literature, I found two one was 2,4-DRB, which is still used, and the other was benzamide, which was very unusual uh, chemical, but not uh, used by many researchers. But there's a study in, in uh, polytin chromosome, some insects, that benzamide inhibited chromosome transcription. And so, so the choice was between these two. And it was made simpler because 2,4-DRB was very expensive, beyond reach of the lab, but benzamide within lab's budget reach. And so I got benzamide and started doing my experiment. And yes, it did inhibit chromosome transcription, but not nuclear transcription. But the most interesting thing that happened was a serendipitous observation uh, while doing these studies, that, and, and which is where started the 93D story. And, and as this shows, the this picture here is what was published in 1970 in the Software Information Service. It's very interesting. This Software Information Service was started by Morgan in 1916, as a preprint service, which is very common now, but uh, you know, think of Morgan's uh, farsightedness that every year a printed volume will uh, will be published and will be circulated free to all the software research across the world, and and that's where we send this small note 
that when we give a brief in vitro treatment of Lagosphere glands of Drosophila to 10 millimeter benzamide, chromosome transcription is inhibited. The technique then used was, which is now an extinct technique, no more use, but a very powerful technique that you label these cells with tissue to uridine so that wherever RNA synthesis is happening, those parts will become radioactive and then make a cellular preparation, expose it to a special autotic effect film. After a few days of expo exposure, develop the film and see the image. And so now you can see, for example, the uh, one can see the polytrin chromosomes here and the small grains that, we, that are silver grains. And counting these grains will let us know the rate of synthesis, which no the technique allows uh, the northern PCR give you total RNA, but not the rate of synthesis. It was a very powerful technique. And using this, what was, was seen that in control cells, this puff was very uh, was active. But after benzamide treatment, by the rest of the chromosome uh, stopped taking tissue uridine because they don't have silver grains. This particular region was heavily labeled. And that's what, it was not related to what was doing for my PhD, but it was, and that's what I say, it was a serendipity that, what is this? That, that's what became the curiosity. And then what, what we knew in 1970s was the relationship between POPs, gene activity, and proteins, which we now know very clearly, was not yet established. It was conjectured that POPs are types of gene activity, and they somehow regulate protein synthesis, but that was not demonstrated. And I thought 93D POP would be a remarkable thing to show this, and, and, and I should take this as my uh, independent research project once I get my independent investigator position. And, and that's where I got interested. My journey with 93D started. And, and the, my hypothesis at that time was that the singular transcription activation of 93D pop by benzamide should be associated with synthesis of a new protein. And how do I identify a new protein? By, by labeling with radioactive amino acids and detecting uh, the new synthesis protein by autodigraph of electrophoretically separated proteins. This, this appeared a very simple experiment, but unfortunately for me, it, it was more than 10 years away because of lack of funds, non-availability of proper slabs and electrophoretic system. And we tried many methods, but didn't succeed. It was very frustrating, uh, but, but that's what it was. Finally, I moved to Banaras in 1976. Tapas Mukherjee, a student of Calgary University again, joined me for PhD, and he did something remarkable. He, with his own hands, assembled a vertical slab electrophoretic apparatus and is their dryer. And having done that, now we, we could think that all, all right, we will now know what protein it makes. But things happen differently. Parallelly, another student of mine, Ajit Singh, showed that 93 power Benjamin Edison property is preserved across the soft lab. Tested about seven eight different species, and in all of them, one of the heat shock induced powers was also singularly inducible by Benjamin. But that was what he, he could show with his apparatus and uh, that he uh, created that we, we give benzamide treatment, we do not see any new protein synthesized in other heat shock proteins, nor anything else. So apparently, it appeared to be a non-coding one. And, and this was a shock. Because just two years ago, Craig Susumono and others had uh, proclaimed that non-coding DNA is selfish or junk. It shows evolutionary conservation, but they don't make protein, and, and therefore they're selfish. And, and that's where it, it appeared a question is 93D gene also a selfish one? But I never believed in selfish or junk DNA. I never, because I had faith in power of natural selection. And then by that time, there was some evidence from Erlo Pardu's lab at MIT that 93D gene of is essential for development. If, if, if uh, her lab created deletions, and because of the deletions, the homozygous deleted uh, embryos will die. And therefore, uh, it, it further uh, strengthened my view that it is neither non-coding nor self, I mean it's non-coding but not selfish or junk. And, and therefore we continued our studies on this gene and in 80s and 90s we examined uh, various ways, what are the inducible properties, what conditions it, uh, this gene is activated and uh, what effect it has on other activities particularly, that's where my interest in HSP-70 genes and heat shock genes got uh, generated because uh, uh, 93D puff somehow affected the HSP-70 gene transcription. And then in, the, in a collaborative study with uh, Marilyn Pardew at MIT, we examined the transcription uh, profile 
of uh, the natty 3D gene after heat shock and bezomide, and this, this came out as a paper in Journal Cell Biology. Then in 1990s, uh, Moshe Mutsuti joined my lab, and she did uh, something remarkable. She, uh, she standardized microinjection to soft embryos to make a transgenic lines. And I'm very happy to say that our lab provided the first transgenic uh, flight generated in India. And, and, and using LAGJ as a reporter, we created the promoter region, and this paper came out in Developmental Genetics. Uh, then uh, Madhu later on uh, started looking, uh, characterizing promoter in a different way. We used chromosome deletions which are different regions deleted upstream. She mapped them at the end level. Uh, now, of course, it's much easier with genome sequence level. But in 1990s, this was the only way that we do southern hybridization, find out which region is missing, how far it is missing. And using that, we could map that the benzamide inducible property of uh, 93 puff is the, the promoter seems to be almost 21 kilo base upstream. Now, of course, we need to go back at the genome sequence and find out uh, which I hope uh, someday will do that. Then in the later part, we started using those lag G lines, another lag G line that was uh, generated in some other lab as a part of the P element metagenesis screen and RNA RNA in situ hybridization. And then, then we characterize the, its expression of this gene using lag G uh, reporters and using in situ hybridizations and in the entire developmental uh, tissue types of Drosophila and published that paper in Journal Cell Biology. This remains still a reference point to see where the gene is expressed. But this RNA in situ also gave us a new idea now. Now we could think of what this non-coding RNA does. And, and that's where we publish a paper in Current Science that the non-coding transcripts of this gene uh, regulate trafficking and evaluate the nuclear RNA processing protein. Prashant uh, who and, and Rajendra who are working and Pritha Ray was working. Uh, Pritha Ray is now in Actric, uh, Mumbai. Prashant is, uh, uh, is professor at uh, University of Illinois, but they did something remarkable. And uh, Prashant's work particularly led us to discover a new organelle in nucle nuclear that is we call omega specus, which was based on the transcripts of this gene and the HNRNP protein that associate. What they, the, one of the regions was in situ hybridization. We could see that the, uh, the 93 RNA was present at the site of transcription, at the, uh, where I'm showing my pointer, and these red dots, which are which you call it omega speckle, they're not on chromosomes, but in the interchromosome space in the nucleus. And given heat shock, very quickly, all this RNA will disappear from nucleus, include, and all that will see at the site of uh, its transcription. And, and by about 30 minutes of heat shock, uh, the protein, the, the RNA is completely missing from everywhere else. And parallelly, one of the HNRNP that we tested at that time, uh, HIP36 or HNRNP A1 homolog, also behaved same way. And then we did immunoprecipitation and with uh, which HIP36 or, or uh, HIP87F, same name. And we could find in the immunoprecipitate that 93D RNA comes in. And along with that, we could also show that two other HNRNPs also get co precipitated. So then we suggested that these omega speckles comprise this RNA and a variety of HNRNPs together, they make the omega speckles. And since then, we have been following these omega speckles at, uh, cell biologically as well as molecularly. And what we could, what we now know uh, at the fly base now shows that this gene is a very long gene, more than 20 kilobase long. At the end, it has a microRNA sequence. Besides this, uh, this G itself makes seven transcripts by two alternate transcription start sites, four termination sites, and an intron which is variably spliced. And more interestingly, the first exon of this gene has a 27 amino acid open reading frame, which, as I will come later on, is actually translated. We have now compared the very recently published paper in Journal Genetics that in 34 to soft life species, this DNA sequence is present, but the primary base sequence is highly variable, except certain motifs which are highly conserved. The structure of the gene in most species has two exons in the proximal part, a repeat part of the middle region, and microRNA in the end. And more importantly, the uh, these omega speaker that are there, as I showed earlier also, that all the HNRNPs 
are absolutely parallel in receiving this omega RNA, and that's what describes the omega speckles. Uh, moreover, now more recently, uh, Anand uh, showed that every Drosophila cell type has these omega speckles, which aggregate at the 93D locus itself are following heat shock, which you can see in polytin chromosomes very well. They can control these uh, yellow regions, the HNRPs are distributed on all active sites. Heat shock within 15 minutes, they begin to disappear from there. They increase the accumulation at the 93D sites. And by 30 minutes of heat shock or 40 minutes of heat shock, they have disappeared from everywhere else except at this particular 93D site. Allow these, these cell grants or the cells to recover, and within 30 minutes or so, the normal protein distribution has happened. What was what we have shown interestingly that if by some mechanism we inhibit transcription at this site during heat shock or this gene is missing, the proteins will not go back to the chromosome site and the organs will die. And that's very interesting. And what we also felt was that this is a very parallel behavior which has been shown later on for SAT3 repeat uh, RNA in humans, which, which formulate the nuclear stress bodies. The behavior of uh, SAT3 RNA and the HSR omega RNA uh, uh, is very similar. And, and this is what we could also show that here yeah, this is in control, a wild type, uh, heat shock, we allow to recover, and cell gets back to this thing. If we deplete the RNA uh, the, by RNAi, most of me, Malik generated these RNAi lines. If we deplete this by uh, activating RNA during heat shock, the omega speckles disappear. And uh, the, the, the HNRP do not move to the side but remain diffuse all over. If we overexpress, same thing happens. We have a US line where we can overexpress this gene, and there also uh, the, the omega speckles behave differently. There's a near null line which are generated in lab in Australia, which we examine, and they don't have omega speckles under normal conditions as well as a heat shock condition. So 93D transcripts are essential for omega speckle formation. And as you can see that during heat shock, omega speckles which are here gradually disappear, and this side increases in size. When you allow the same cell to recover, something dramatic happens. Uh, the the, this is the big, big block with the 93 region. It keeps on shrinking and omega speckles come out of this fully formed. So th and this is very interesting that when they disappear from nuclear plant, they don't move physically as such to the uh, 93 degree side, but move in a diffuse form. But they are assembled at the 93 degree side during recovery and then they are released. And this assembly requires, we have shown in a paper in 2015, Anand Singh and myself, that requires chromatin remodelers, it requires uh, nuclear matrix proteins. Uh, a variety of other proteins are essential for the normal assembly of these omega, spe and, uh, omega speckles. And now we know similar things happen in mammalian uh, cells also, like the paraspeckles. They also are assembled at their site of uh, transcription of the NEAT1 and NEAT2 RNA, non coding RNAs. They also need chromatin remodelers. So apparently, across the system, there's a very similar organization of uh, non-coding RNA providing the basis for assembly of these phase-separated entities in the, in the nucleus. And, and, and they, they regulate uh, a variety of proteins that translate uh, their uh, dynamics in the nuclear during different conditions. Moshe Malik could also show that using RNA or overexpression, that depending upon in which cell type we down-regulate this or overexpress this, it, it results in certain remarkable phenotypes. Another thing that Moshe Mali could show was that this RNA is also involved in apoptotic pathways. Uh, by uh, sequestering HNRPK, it, is, it, it makes a DAP1 uh, stabilized, and if DAP1 is stabilized, the pro path uh, proteins like HIT, Reaper, and GRIN cannot activate caspases, and therefore induced apoptosis is inhibited when this gene is misfunctioning or not functioning adequately. Uh, uh, Somali did another interesting study. We, we got interested in neurodegeneration and she could show that if we downregulate this RNA, then neurodegeneration is suppressed. And, and then Moshe Mali followed. We had a series of papers that uh, downregulates of this non-coding RNA uh, suppresses neurodegeneration Overexpression aggregates, uh, uh, aggravates this, and I think this happens again because of 
multiple role that these RNAs play in regulating RNA binding proteins and other important regulatory proteins. I'll, I'll come to that later on. Then, as I was saying, that the chromatin re models like ISWI, this was a collaboration with a group in uh, Italy, uh, the, the, where, where we showed that if the ISWI is absent, omega spectral are not formed, we said these proteins remain as long streaks in the nucleus, and these individuals do not survive. That, that, that's where we got the lead, and we could now show with Anand Singh in 2015 that yes. Uh, omega spectral are not released from the side during uh, recovery from heat shock if ISOI protein is absent. Then more recently, Mukulika uh, Ray has examined uh, activated RAS expression and its relation with HSR omega. This happened because Pritha Ray in 90s had seen that uh, activated RAS expression, overexpression of RAS and HSR omega interacted, and so Mukulika Ray followed it. And what, what she could show was very interestingly that that the activated RAS itself causes eye, eye roughening. This is a technique, nail polish imprint, that earlier in my lab, Richa Arya had uh, devised, which we, we get uh, absolute SEM-like pictures without an SEM. It's simple nail polish that we put on the eyes, lift it up, and we can see in microscope the beautiful material arrangement. And using that, what Mukulika could show that if you overexpress uh, activated RAS in eye cells, eyes are very severely damaged. And this damage gets aggravated when, along with activated RAS, you either down-regulate HSR omega or up-regulate HSR omega. Now, this was very strange, that how could down-regulation and as well as up-regulation have the same phenotype? And, and this was puzzling. It took us three years to convince reviewer that, yes, this can happen. Finally, we could show, and we could also understand the mechanism for this. And, and that mechanism we could show by doing RNA sequencing, and what we showed was that if we downregulate HSR omega, then the positive regulators of RAS pathway are upregulated and therefore RAS goes up. If we upregulate HSR omega, this then shows the negative regulators of uh, the uh, RAS pathway are downregulated and therefore RAS goes up. So the consequence is the same. In one way, RAS uh, activators are more active and therefore RAS becomes more. In another case, uh, the inhibitors of RAS are less active and therefore RAS goes more. And in both cases, we get more degeneration and similar phenotypes. Mukulika looked at another uh, phenomenon interaction with uh, the HSP83, which is the HSP90 homologin to Sophila, one of the very uh, robust housekeeping uh, molecular chaperone, as a very important during heat shock. Again, this, this study followed from Pritha Ray's earlier observation 90 is that HSP83 and HSR omega interacted. And there was another report from a Canadian group that during heat shock, HSP83 moves and binds with the 93D puff. And, and this then we, we asked, do they have interaction? And Mukulika examined an HSR omega null. And in that background, she deduced an overexpression of HSP83. So now we have downregulated HSR omega and overexpressing. HSP83. And what we see is that the larvae now do not pupate. They become like uh, the little tumorous larvae. They die as should have pupate. And we dissect them. We see that as the larva gets older without pupating, their brain becomes highly tumorous. And, and we examine this and, uh, and then we examine them. Can that why should this happen? Why should uh, uh, HSP83 up regulation and 93 down regulated background? copy LGL phenotype. And RNA sequencing showed, uh, we, we, we compared many, many uh, RNA uh, sequencing, uh, many genes during this, but what I'm showing right now is that LGL gene gets extremely down-regulated when we have HSP83 overexpression in 93 down background, both in sequencing as well as by RT-PCR, LGL transcripts go down tremendously and therefore we get LGL phenotype and the larvae do not develop further. Now, more recently, what we have started doing is because, as I said, that it makes uh, multiple transcripts. So, what these transcripts have done is uh, uh, Ranjan Sahu, uh, currently uh, working for PSG, has generated a whole series of transgenic lines in which each of the transcript code, uh, coding part has been put downstream of a US promoter so that we can activate each transcript individually. And, and parallelly, we have also created 
this for cash based deletion of the whole hs omega so the entire transcriptal region is missing now and what we are trying to do is that in this hs omega deletion background we introduce one by one of these transients and then see which one that is restored and what happens parallelly uh, uh, we have also created an orf omega knockout that means uh, i i said that there is a 23 amino acid uh, orf in the exon one of this gene which may be translated so we specifically knocked it out through crispr cas rest of the gene is normal and then we have started looking at the phenology as to what do they do and interestingly what uh, okay before i go to that let me show you that the how why, why this or of omega became important uh, early study in medical pathology lab suggested this is translatable in vitro but now we wanted to show in vivo so ranjan generated this 27 amino acid peptide fused in frame to egfp created transgenics and what we could show was that the egfp was now larger by the 27 amino acid size as you can see in western in the wild type and these transgenic line all of them show this egfp protein band at a higher size uh, which which include this 3 uh, 27 amino acid and we could show the gfp fluorescence also in all all the cells that means this protein is translated it's not just uh, an excellent blower it is indeed translated in vivo the question is does it have a function or to just an excellent peptide now we know that many small peptides have become very important in biology and that's why this also look very promising and 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 so that led us to generate that uh, or of uh, omega knockout uh, or of uh, knockout and what we now is the strategy was that we generated the guide rna where uh, uh, dipti trivedi from ncbs helped us in designing this and generated the knockout and what we could ultimately have is this whole knockout the whole gene is missing or only the or of uh, is missing and having got that what what we see is if we have the whole gene missing the homozygous embryos most of them die a few emerge as first and star they persist at first and star for 6 7 days and then they die more so 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 this we are following up as to what happens we reduce one by one the other tranche that i mentioned that which which will rescue their phenotype and what kind of rescue that happens the or of omega knockout has given us very interesting results one is that many of them die but still many of them come out as adults because they have other omega transcripts are all right only the short transcript which which would make the or of uh, the peptide is perhaps not being made they have many defects but most striking defect is that the females are completely sterile not males males are fertile females are completely sterile and when you look at their ovaries it seems try by using various uh, immunosaining for fast three or for lamin that the germinal region is in defect germinal region initially it makes but then very soon it degenerates and we don't see germinal cells we don't see the connecting going on and they lay a very few eggs which are very fragile and they are not fertilizable and therefore they are completely sterile and this happens only in females not in males and this is something that the summarizer that we have shown a large number of proteins i didn't talk about obviously on the data that we have generated that hs omega nuclear rna particularly that i'm talking about not with the orf the saprophage rna but the nuclear rna which include the repeat region is extremely sensitive to cellular intracellular and extracellular signals and immediately gets activated or uh, inhibits its activity or affects other genes and the what that the within the nucleus what happens is it will influence a variety of chromatin remodelers which will then uh, transcription factors and which will then affect chromatin organization and transcription regulators a whole variety of rna binding proteins like the diverse hnrps sxl snf uh, and, and so on and so forth which then will affect rna stability rna splicing rna trafficking hs omega and rna also interact with nuclear lamin proteins nuclear core proteins like megator and that can influence the movement of rna across the nuclear envelope and all of this will have a global effect on cell function on the other hand this also has interaction with the apoptotic machinery bap1 jnk pathway proteasome apoptotic factors and so that this gene 
plays a very important role in deciding whether a cell will survive or will die. It has interacted with RAS. It interacts with HSPT3. HSPT3 and RAS also interact. It interacts with uh, HSP70. And that means that it can also modulate activities of the molecular chaperones. And based on this, we suggested long back that non-coding RNAs, I mean, this was a suggestion that we started making in, in early 2000, that they are essential for survival. They are not just selfish or junk DNA. They are essential. And many of these long non-coding RNAs can act as uh, hubs, regulatory hubs, which because of their networking, can manipulate, can modulate multiple pathways at the HS omega and thus. And I think this is becoming a standard uh, belief now that many no, long known coding RNAs precisely re uh, regulate multiple pathways uh, through direct interaction with variety of proteins, direct interaction with DNA, direct interaction with other RNAs, with uh, microRNAs, and all varieties of RNA that we have in the cell now. And so, uh, uh, I've written a number of reviews on the LNC RNA in the recent years, which can be seen. The most recent one, which came out just last week, is a, is a big chapter in, uh, in a book uh, where we have uh, described all kinds of known coding RNAs, what are their functions, and so on. And, and, and this is also available. So, uh, during this long journey, I just listed here the names of uh, students who earned their PhD working on, on this 93D gene. Starting with Tapas, uh, Ajit, unfortunately, he passed away early. Bimlendi is in Pune. Tapas was in Chandigarh. Now, of course, he's retired. Uh, uh, Bimlendi is uh, retired. He's uh, emeritus at Pune University. Deprating was at ITRC, Lucknow. So he's Institute. He also retired recently. Pradeep Parma is at uh, South Campus, Delhi. Abhay is, uh, is at IGIB. Moshe Mutsudi is a faculty in BHU, Molecular Imaging Department. Pritha Ray is at... Uh, at Craig, not working on Drosophila, working on uh, uh, in neuro mapping of cancer in humans. Madhu is a faculty professor at DHU, uh, continues to work with Drosophila on uh, the Ayurvedic biology and immune response. KV Prashant, as I said, is uh, now at University of Illinois, faculty there. Rajendra is uh, back in India in Pune. Ashesh Lal was my postdoc, brother with PhD, he's in NIH now. Sonali is, uh, was at VIT now, he has moved to Birmingham. Sri Krishna is a faculty at BHU. Moshe Malik is in the uh, Netherlands doing her postdoc. Akamcha is doing her postdoc and uh, was in uh, uh, Delhi University, now has moved to IIT Chennai. Roshan is in Bangalore. Anand Kumar Singh, after doing PhD uh, postdoc in uh, Birmingham, I understand that he got Ramlinga Swami Fellowship and he should come back. Deputa Chaturvedi had taken a different job now. He's in DBT as one of the scientific officers. Mukulika Ray is now doing her PhD in the uh, US. Ranjan Sao and Rima are working. Besides this, there were a number of others who worked on different other areas of like replication, heterochromatity, niche of proteins, and so on. I've not listed them. Uh, my funding has been uh, through uh, currently with DBT and SCRB. I'm happy that I will have this funding for a long time to come and I can continue. And with that, I come to conclusion, uh, and of course, uh, the part of the line that my lab is still open for those who want to do their PhD or postdoc research in this exciting area. And the soft line, 93 puff has been extremely good model, very fertile models. And, and I thank all my students, my staff who have carried this story and other stories during the last five decades. And of course, funding from UGC, DSE, DBT, and uh, I mean, almost all funding agencies in the country has supported our lab's work. So I, I, with that, I thank you all and we'll, we'll be happy to take questions. Yes. Uh, yeah. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Lakotia, for sharing your extraordinary journey in science expanding for more than 50 years. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's wonderful to, to see, you know, such a nice, interesting uh, biology, basic biology. So, uh, I mean, we have received lots of questions uh, and we have a pretty good amount of time for Q&A session. So I'll take a few, few of the questions, what we received. Uh,
Yes, questions. Let me know. I'll yeah, yeah. You. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from uh, Sanjari Godai, uh, she's asking uh, to, to clarify the chromosomal deletion in, in promoter mapping. What you okay. showed. All right. You see, what we did was we that they uh, see Drusovl has a wonderful system. A huge number of deletions are available, and and you know Drusovl flies can fly across nations without a passport and visa. That that's a remarkable thing. So we got the deletions, which were very small deletions, mapped in and around 93 region. So we mapped them with at the DNA level by sudden hybridization as to which parts are missing, and then examine whether benzamide or Hitchcock were induced in 93 puff or not, which we could do chromosomally. So we use these chromosomal deletions, which you could see in the chromosome. Uh, uh, like, uh, okay, if I can go back to that slide. Yeah, uh, you see here, the, these are the map of the polytrine chromosomes, and these are the regions that are deleted that we could map. And then depending on which region is missing, we could see puffing happening, transcription happening or not happening. And based on uh, combining this observation at polytrine chromosomes and at the DNA level, southern habitation in this proponent chromosome that we showed, that the if we delete this, about 21 kb upstream of this, of the 93D gene, benzamide puffing disappears. Fischer puffing can still happen, but benzamide puffing will not happen unless some, some region here is available. And, and that's what was map, mapped at that time. I hope I've been able to explain some ideas about this. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, yeah, so let's moving on to the next question uh, from Oindrila Das. Uh, she's asking, sir, please elaborate on the uh, alternative splicing, which results into seven transcript formation. Well, well the seven transcripts are not because of alternative splicing, but they're primarily because they're two transcription start sites and uh, four termination sites. Okay, let me see if I can get back to that slide. All right. And this slide, as you can see, that there is one transcription site from which all the transcripts start. And then there is another transcript start site, which is about 500 base pair upstream of the first, uh, the other transcript start site. And then there's one termination here, one termination here, one termination here, one at the end, and, and one in, in the middle. And, and then in, there's only one intron, which can be spliced, cannot be spliced. And therefore, in total, by using two transcription start sites, four termination sites and a variable splicing of single intron, it generates these seven transcripts. And then if we take these two microRNAs, there are two more microRNAs coming in, which we absolutely have no idea right now as to what they do, why they are part of this gene in all the 34 species that we examined. All the species have a microRNA gene, exactly the same microRNA gene here. But primarily this gene in all species gives multiple transcripts and what we suggest is that it has uh, perhaps one or two transcription start sites, but multiple termination sites. How does it regulate? For example, benzamide will cause induction of more of this uh, bigger RNA, while Hitchhock will generate more of the cell with RNA. So apparently, the regulatory circuits decide which promoters are to be used and which are not to be used. That's how this uh, thing goes on. Yeah, uh, so uh, she has uh, one continuation question. I think uh, it's now cleared after after listening to you. Uh, next, moving on to the next question from Anjali Kulkarni. Uh, she's asking, uh, are the omega speckles conserved during evolution in different organisms? Well, you see, speckle-like structures are common in almost all eukaryotes. In mammals, we have two kinds of speckles. One is the splicing speckle. There is uh, the other is para speckle, and omega speckle share properties with both splicing speckle, some properties, some properties with para speckle, and some properties with the SAT3 dependent uh, nuclear stress bodies. The splicing speckles are again dependent on another non coding RNA, MALAT1, uh, whereas the para speckles are dependent on NEAT1 and NEAT2 non coding RNAs. 
and the nuclear stress bodies are uh, another non coding RNA SAT3. They, all of them have similar property that they are they produce multiple isoforms, they are very abundantly transcribed, they respond to stress. And so, what it seems is that in evolution, the common function done by omega speckle had diversified. And as the uh, species uh, evolution, the uh, life uh, became more complexly organized, the, the omega speckle function has also got separated into multiple uh, pathways. But these speckles are common feature of all eukaryotic cells. Another question from Arijit Chakraborty. Uh, he's asking, uh, do you think HSR omega is also inducing other non-coding genes or is it some other factor which are inducing this non-coding gene expression? Well, you see, I wouldn't say no, the HSR omega directly, we have not seen any binding with DNA as such. These transcripts do not bind with any DNA directly, but they will influence multiple transcripts by modulating the availability, the, mob the mobility of variety of transcription regulatory factors. For example, in our HSP83 and L, uh, the HS Omega interaction paper that came out last year in Journal Bioscience, we could show that the LGL gene promoter has binding sites for HSP83, for HNRNPs, and because HSR Omega uh, affects HSP83 activity, affects uh, HNRNPs, the net effect happens in other genes transcripts. Actually, when we compare the RNA sequence uh, uh, the, the, the transcriptome of wild type and HSR omega deficient cells, huge number of genes are affected, but not directly. It is obviously via indirect pathways. It may affect through microRNA, it may affect through introns, it may affect through uh, HNRNPs and, and other proteins. Yeah. Uh Another question from uh, Sandeep Pramanik. Uh, what does it mean by germinal uh, region? Okay, germinal region in the ovary is the region where the germ the stem cells are present. There, there, there's a whole series of germinal stage of development. There, there are germ cells which are precursor to for the, all these cells that will undergo meiosis later on. So that that pre uh, beginning part of the ovary into sophila is called germarium, where the germ cells are, uh, the precursors of germ cells are located, uh, which, uh, the, uh, which will divide mitotically to generate more cells, and then one of them will undergo meiosis to produce the oocyte proper. So germarium is the kind of stem cell component of the uh, meiotic cells, of the germ cells. Sanchari Gorai uh, has a question. Is the uh, Megator of mTOR family gene? Is the Megator of? Is the Megator is of uh, mTOR family gene? Does it belong to mTOR family? Yes, yes. It, it is actually mTOR. mTOR is a uh, full name is uh, Megator. Uh, the, 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 that, that's the same, same family protein, yes. Uh, Suchodita Patra is asking, uh, is there any structural homologous of HSR omega like LNC RNA found in human? Yes, SAT3 is one of the most important candidates for uh, as function analog of HSR omega. The, 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 this we had uh, suggested in, in a review in uh, Nucleic Acid Research in 2006 that HSR omega and SAT3 are function analogs. And actually, now I understand more recently that the uh, in some lab, uh, Subram Panesh lab at IIT Kanpur, they have shown that uh, in Drosophila deficient for HSR omega, if they put uh, SAT3 transcripts, they, 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 these are not yet published, but but I know that we have shared the data that if SAT3 transcripts are present present there, the deficiency of HSP83 can be complemented. So they seem to be functionally analogous. And there has been another study from Bonini's lab in the U.S. where they have shown that in Drosophila, neurodegeneration, uh, like uh, because of TDP43 or FUS, can be equally affected by SAT3 transcripts or HSR omega transcripts. So, so th these two transcripts seem to be doing similar functions in the cell, which, which is something that we have 
predicted in 2006. Okay. Yeah, this is really interesting. Uh, yeah, so another question from um, Swarupa Sarkar. Have you shown any uh, relationship between this LNC RNA with the aging pattern of uh, Drosophila? As you have said that it controls apoptosis or, or cell viability? Well, we, we have not done that analysis yet. Although we have done RNA sequencing from young and old flies, but we are not yet analyzed completely. And we do not know... But, they, but one thing we know, that when the HSR omega RNA are depleted, either by RNAi or by mutation, the flies don't live very long. They die very early. But I can't say that they have a role in aging itself. They may die very early because many functions go wrong in that process, and therefore they cannot continue. But whether during aging, how does the HSR omega transcription profile changes is... Uh, once we analyze our RNA-seq data completely, we will know that, that part. We have data from young flies, middle-aged flies, and very old flies. And, and we need to compare the uh, complete profile, and then we'll know how does it change. But it should change, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, from uh, Supojit Datta, uh wants to know uh, a nail polish imprint microscopy technique. Oh, what was that? I, I didn't get that question clearly. What is, what yeah, is he wants to know uh, how the nail polish imprint microscopy, nail polish, uh, nail polish imprint microscopy has okay. been done. Nail polish imprint, you see, it's a very simple technique. You can see current science paper, but basically what it means is you take an adult fly remove, uh, decapitate it, take the head part, put a drop of nail polish, transfer nail polish on it, let the nail polish dry, and then just peel off the layer with, with fine forceps. And put that uh, peel of nail polish, which, which had taken the shape of the eye, on a microscope slide, look under the microscope, and you see the entire material array beautifully arranged. Exact replica. Uh, uh, the same image as I showed you will look... Uh, exactly like what you see in understanding the microscope. And so this technique has been very widely used now across the world, which was developed by Richa, again, accidental, uh, drop fail, and she thought, okay, let's see what has happened. And she found that it provides a very beautiful replica of the eye surface. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, yeah. Another question from uh, Devashri Golda. What kind of interactions is taking place between HSR Omega engine RAS uh, leading to alteration of cell function? Well, basically, I think what HSR Omega does is one of the functions that uh, one is peptide. Peptide will have many functions, which we still do not know, but we know it has very important function. That's one part. How it functions is something that we one, one needs to analyze for the but the nuclear transcripts, because of their organization of omega speckles, it is through the omega speckles uh, that they regulate a whole variety of RNA binding proteins, transcription factors, RNA splicing proteins, uh, the uh, RNA transporters, and by mod modulating their activities, it can have a kind of global effect on the cell function. And so it's the RNA is not directly binding with different genes and regulate their activity. It is perhaps functioning via its interaction with the, these RNA binding proteins. And we still do not know what that microRNA is going to do. That could be another possible way that this RNA can have an effect on this cell function. So there are lots of exciting questions still remaining. And, and I wish I was 30 years young today to follow it up. <laughs> That this this is something <laughs> extraordinary. This energy, uh, yeah. So another question uh, from uh, Sachin Ji Swami. Uh, in general, uh, considering the biological system, how important it is to look at RNA dynamics, and uh, we might often miss the complexity of the system, or uh, it may be underestimated while looking at proteins. What is your comment on this? 
Well, I certainly will say that RNA is very, very important. The whole idea of, I, I wrote an article on this, that the junk DNA, selfish DNA, did help us look at the protein part in more detail. Yes, we, we could understand the whole molecular biology of proteins, how do they regulate. But then when we look at the complex biological system, proteins alone cannot do. RNA has to play an important role. And now we know that every day, hundreds of new uh, long non coding RNA, micro RNAs, circular RNAs, and whole variety of RNAs are being discovered. And more and more uh, phenotypes are associated, more and more diseases are associated with these. And obviously, we, we must understand. Uh, you know, I, I give very typical example, uh, in a classroom example, where very often I say that, for example, in a, in a teaching institution, we need teachers, we need students. That's it. But why do we have so many of non-teaching staff? What do they do? They neither teach nor study, but they are essential. They regulate. They, they do many of the functions. And I think that's where, in the, in the, in the cell, DNA carries the information. Proteins are the master tra the translators of that information, the sense of, of functions. But then to regulate, to ensure that function happen in the right place, right uh, time, and the right amount, it's, that's where these diverse RNAs become very important. And it's unfortunate that we ignored them for so many years. Especially, uh, I, I would want to share this point again. In 1960s, RNA was a very hot topic. Lots of large, many labs were studying RNA, and they did discover many RNAs which did not leave nucleus, and they wondered what it is doing. But then the central dogma placed so, so much of great emphasis on the proteins, DNA makes RNA, RNA makes proteins, that people forgot that RNA can do something else as well. And, but thankfully, after the discovery of microRNA and RNAi phenomenon in 1990s, and uh, with, nine, uh, with 2000, this uh, millennium has really become, uh, the first two decades have become uh, where RNA has got its prime importance and it's going to have many, many more importance. Same way, we have been ignoring small peptides. Uh, because we, we say any RNA which doesn't make a, a peptide of less than uh, uh, 100 amino, more than 100 amino acids is non-coding. Again, that's wrong. There are many RNA that do not have long ORF but have short ORFs and these peptides are also critical. So even small molecules, large molecules, RNA, proteins, all of them will have to interact to define what we are. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question. So uh, now I'll take a couple of more questions before I uh, finish off. Uh, so uh, from Abhishek Guha, uh, he's asking, are there other stresses other than a heat shock that can if affect uh, HSR Omega? Well, uh, 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 heat shock is the one. Other stresses like oxidative stress, uh, starvation stress also do similar things. So most stress, uh, the cell stress conditions bring about similar change. I, I won't say absolutely similar change, identical. Similar change in the HSR omega and the HNRB distribution in the cell. But the transcript profile can be different. The, uh, of, of the HSR omega, which transcripts are more and which are less, can vary with the user or the stress condition. But with reference to the uh, transcription inhibition that happens global, that is associated with uh, the proteins moving back to the natural free locus and omega speckle disappearing in the cell. That's a common phenomenon. Okay. Uh, so with this question, we'll uh, close the Q&A session. Uh, this is from Anand Singh. He's asking, uh, is there any difference in HSR omega transcripts expressed following amide or heat shock treatment? Well, yes, yeah, that was shown way back in 1989 paper that I said with uh, collaboration with uh, Madhu Pardu that heat shock induces both the nuclear and cellular transcripts uh, with cellular transcripts being more abundant. Benzamide induces less of cellular transcript but induces more of the nuclear transcript. But this has been uh, known since that time and, and we know that, that that's what the situation is. And the reason being heat shock inhibits both translation as well as transcription. Benzamide doesn't inhibit transcription, it inhibits only uh, transcription, chromosome transcription. And that's where we, we suggested that the 
small RNA and possibly the peptide may have a role in translation. This needs to be examined further. Thank you, Professor Lakotia, for answering so many questions. And we are already getting yeah, appreciation from, uh, from you know, in our chat boxes. Excellent. Uh, uh, thanks again. And with this note, uh, I'd request uh, Professor Inaroy Banerjee to express the vote of thanks and close the session. Over to you, uh, ma'am. Thank you, Sundaram. Thank you, Professor Lakotia. Before we close and before we give the thank yous, I have a question for you. Yes, um, uh, so this is a remarkable journey. And I want to say that we are not going to be we want to listen to more. This is an extraordinary journey. And when you started your lecture, I like that part where when you were scrounging for uh, funds and instruments, because that is an experience that we all go through. And uh, then, uh, you know, when things are not really falling into place and then we wonder what are we going to do next? And then, you know, things just happen if you, um, if you persist. If you yeah. persevere. Yeah. So, uh, the there. so I have a question for you. When I was reading out your introductory uh, note, I noticed that uh, part about a quality publication from India and uh, about uh, your views on higher education. So I'd like you to share your views with us, please, on this platform. Well, well, about publication, I think we have got into a very wrong practice of distinguishing national and international journals and uh, giving less cre credibility to papers published in Indian journals. Yes, we have problem with predatory journals, we have problem with poor quality journals, but then there are certain good journals which do have good review policy, which are widely read, and why we do not publish them? Because Somehow, it, it seems our ego is uh, hurt if I publish in India. I know many young people will complain that if they publish in Indian journals, they'll be thrown out of a short list or something, something. I, I consider this very, very unfortunate situation. And, and we need to all protest and change it. Absolutely. The, the, the only thing I can say in support of this, that, for example, some, uh, I have published 50% of my papers from the beginning of my career in so-called national journals. By choice, not by compulsion by choice. It is certainly my policy. And citation of these journals is as good as, as of those of... And in fact, my best cited journal, a review that uh, Richard, Arya, Moshe, Malik and my, myself wrote together in 2007 on stress proteins and published in J Bioscience had nearly 500 ISI Web of Knowledge citations. And, and I don't think that this reflects anything uh, other than that people read them, people appreciate them. And therefore, my advice to all young people, seniors are, let's forget about them, but the young people must take it uh, their, in their uh, uh, policy that they will publish good articles in national journals, fight for it, and improve them. Because unless the journal gets a good manuscript, its quality will not go up. So they're in a vicious circle. I don't give them good quality. What can editor do? They'll have to publish whatever it is. And so unless we start uh, submitting good journals, uh, uh, good articles to journals in India, which are which have good review policy, I, I'm not saying that we submit to anyone. Identify the journals that have good review policies, good publication policies, and let's encourage them, support them. That's what is important. Absolutely. Um, any comments on higher education uh, the national education policy you would like to share with us? The national education policy, we had long back suggested that the, and this was a paper that we published based on a discussion at the Indian National Science Academy and other academies together, that post-school education needs to be completely changed. We, the kind of compartment that we have, uh, that we take bioscience or we take math, math science and uh, we, we study only three subjects and nothing else is completely wrong. We need to change that. We, every student, if a science student particularly, must study physics, chemistry, biology, maths, even at post undergraduate level. Not that in equal emphasis, but a bio student being completely ignored on maths and a physics student completely ignored on biology, 
is where we have gone completely wrong. We need to change that. The new education policy, I'm worried about it. Honestly, we have uh, com made comments from science from science academies. There are certain issues that we let's see how it gets implemented and how it goes on. But I personally maintain education at all levels, research at all levels is a social responsibility. And in large quantity, it should be governmental responsibility, not left to private uh, hands who, who can uh, put enormous fees and only few limited uh, kinds of uh, society can participate in that and large number remains kind of uh, in, in a bad situation. We, we must not do that. Even if we have private institutions, we must ensure that opportunities are equal whether I'm rich or I'm poor. I come from uh, metropolitan areas or I come from rural areas. The opportunity must be equal. It, it should not be dependent on, on the social status, and which is where my worry about the new policy is, honestly. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I, I agree with you. We need to decolonize our minds first, that we, we should stop looking forever at the West for yes. uh, recognition. It is uh, our self-pride and that should and the quality of science that should drive us. Well, thank you so much. It was wonderful to see you again. And thank you to all the participants tonight. Um, uh, Professor Lakotia's talk will be archived in the YouTube channel. And um, many, many more people will be viewing this extraordinary journey of one of our ex most extraordinary scientists um, that we have today. So thank you, everyone. I hope you have uh, the food for thought uh, from the journey, the uh, lessons uh, that um, the experiences of um, a scientist and numerous students. It was so nice to see that the students that you were describing the work and then in the end you uh, said what they are doing now. And so uh, that kind of Guru Shishra Parampara is uh, something that is very, very heartening. Yes. So to all the participants in the platform, uh, our respects uh, to you and thank you all for uh, tuning in to PPP today. So looking forward to many more interesting uh, talks from uh, scientists around us. So thank you and good night. Thanks and best wishes to all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good.